Radio Days Africa 2020 is about to go live. Good afternoon and welcome to Radio Days Africa 2020. My name is Claire Mawisa and we're about to have an incredible session. Thank you so much for joining us. I do want to remind you that Radio Days Africa 2020 is proudly presented by WITS Radio Academy and is made possible through the generous support of the Sub-Saharan Africa Media Program of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. We've got some generous sponsors that I wish to thank right now. Iono FM, thank you so much the Abundant Media Group, RCS Sound Software, and Crossfade Studios. Thank you so much for your generous support. I'm going to ask all of our panelists to please uh, just reveal themselves so we can see their gorgeous faces. Uh, I've been super excited to do this panel since the beginning of Radio Day, so it's been two weeks that I've been waiting for today. Let me introduce our panelists. We have Ntabele Matela, who is a presenter at Metro FM. She presents the 4 a.m. club on Saturdays and Sundays on Metro FM, also an award-winning presenter. We have Vanessa Marawa, who presents till noon, 9 to 12 uh, weekdays on Vuma FM. And we have Shwe Shwe Ku. Is that correct? Uh, voice of its station manager, listen. The fact that we've got an all black, all female uh, panel speaking today just rocks my world because when I was coming up in radio from 1999, I did not have this opportunity. So, you know, for the other sessions, I had to really research and find out what questions am I gonna ask the panelists? For this session, I'm like, I've been waiting to have this conversation for the past 15 years. So that's why I'm super excited to have you guys uh, here today. I mean, I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, it is evident that, I mean, for a very long time, radio has been male dominated. And I don't think we all had the same journey in radio and maybe our journey in radio was different. So I just, I'm gonna ask um, in order of, uh, I'll start with you in Tabileng and then I'll come to you Vanessa and then to you Shreya Shreya. Just tell me about your journey um, in radio as a black woman, you know, what were your intentions you know, when you, before you started radio, did you always want to do radio? And what has that journey been like to get to where you are right now? Uh, thank you so much, Claire. So for me, I think my story is quite different to a lot of people. Um, I started in the corporate industry, in the corporate space for quite some time in my life because I had studied a BCom in economics. So like everyone else, I had a qualification and I basically pursued a career in that field. But I think in the depth of my heart, I always knew that I wanted to pursue radio. I think at the time, I just didn't have the courage, you know, to voice myself. And um, I think it was 2016 where I finally actually started um, taking my passion seriously by attending like different workshops uh, with different, you know how radio presenters would actually have a workshop on a weekend. So I'd actually do that. But I actually realized that in order for me to grow and to learn, I needed to actually get behind the desk, be behind the mic and start the journey of radio. And that's when I was fortunate enough to join Tux FM, already having graduated uh, from the University of Pretoria. So already from that standpoint, the fact that Tux FM was like, it's okay, um, you're no longer a student, but you're welcome to come learn and grow. So it was really for me, to be honest, an environment that I felt uh, was quite conducive to growth and learning. Um, it was a space that prioritized a lot of training in radio. So I think also for me right now, I'm grateful for the fact that I represent possibility to a lot of young campus radio presenters where for a long time, it seemed as though, you know, coming from campus radio, having that training didn't matter so much. It was more about, am I a personality, which I wasn't. So I came into a radio space where I was literally just, you know, a talent, talent trying to be groomed, talent trying to grow. But I found that with a lot of it, um, I had to also navigate a lot of my growth. I couldn't just only take the opportunities that were presented to me at Tux. I also had to reach out to other presenters. So what I did as well in my journey is I reached out to people that I looked up to in the industry. Some were receptive, 
others weren't really, but it's it's also how it's part of life, right? And those that were receptive, I'm really grateful for. They allowed me to come into the studio, allowed me to sit with them, to watch them. And I'm grateful that some of them were black females, one being Ayanda MVP from 947, Tando Taveta on Fiber FM as well, Drive. They let me come into their space, learn from them. Marion as well at Metro FM also allowed me into a space. Um, and then there was also A.B. De Costa on power. So even him as a gentleman allowing me into his space, into his private space of life was also just an honor for me. So I think also a lot of it is, is also our own initiative, you know, knowing is this what you want to do and not only focusing on what's around you, but also taking that step of being responsible for your own growth in essence. So I think today I stand in a position where I'm grateful. Um, it's only now that I'm really starting my commercial radio experience because for the past two years I was on campus radio. So I'm still learning a lot. Uh, for me, I believe the journey has only begun. So yeah, that's pretty much my journey thus far. And for you, Vanessa, I mean, can you tell us about what your journey is? I mean, uh, nine to 12 weekdays is a power slot. It's, you know, you must hold your own in that space. Tell us about the journey to get there. Yeah, my, my story is a bit different because I started out in kind of the television space and had never really considered radio because all the women that I'd heard on radio were such powerhouses. I could not imagine what I would talk about for the time that I'm given to fill that space kind of to the point that I felt that it needed to be, to be filled. So my journey began with... Um, a very short stint on the breakfast show on Novomai FM. And that's when the love of radio began. And so when that slot no longer existed, I had to go away and kind of reassess what is it that I wanted to bring to radio and what did I hope for radio to bring to me? So when I did get the opportunity to host the 9 to 12, it started off as sort of a, a uncharted um, bit of territory for me because I had to figure out what was it that I was going to bring as a black female to radio and at that point in time? And it took, it took a while. It took about a year for me to find my feet and to find the voice that I now have on that slot. And it also had, I had to move away a little bit from what I had this, I had this preconceived notion. It was actually my own fault of what radio was supposed to sound like. All the slick, you know, there were slick DJs before us, people who spoke fast, they were poetic, they had everything, they hit the mark all the time. And I've got to find that if you want to carve your own niche in radio, it's very possible to do that by not emulating the people that came before you and building your own space. And that's really what the journey has been for me and what I'm finding my joy in, in my space between nine and 12. That's beautiful, man. I mean, I think to myself, when I started in radio in 1999, the idea of a female station manager was not even in my scope. It wasn't even in my wildest dream. So, I mean, tell us about your journey, Shosha, you station manager of, uh, of VOW. That is incredible in itself. And that is no easy feat. So could you share your journey in radio? Hi, Vanessa, and hello to everyone. I think for me, I'd say I stumbled into radio because I was out in Cape Town. I was busy doing a degree in electrical engineering. I'm glad that did not work out. Um, I moved into the community radio space. And I think like many other people, I got into community radio thinking, okay, I'm just doing this for now. I'm looking for my next big thing. You know, I want to get into commercial radio. I want to do this and I want to do that. But the, I think I spent six years at that community radio station in Cape Town called Radio Zibonele. Um, and I learned a lot of things there over and above the ability to speak Isikosa at the time. I must say that I've completely lost it now. I sound very bizarre when I tried the language. But I also learned the importance of um, the community radio medium. And I remember um, in 2004, we came to Hauteng. At the time, you know, my first time on a flight. So that community radio station gave me that opportunity. Um, and we were in a session with other guys coming from community radio stations from across South Africa. Um, and the conversations we were having were, 
um, this medium can change people's lives. And I was so inspired, but the challenge was it's not paying me. So I need to move to commercial. You know, I need to move to greater things. And my focus was largely, I wanna be on air, tell stories. And um, so it took me a really long time to discover myself and appreciate that my role in radio is not to be on the mic and not to be presenting. Um, it's aligned to what I really love doing, which is teaching and um, developing young talent and young people. Um, so I moved uh, from Cape Town, came to um, Hauteng, worked at Prime Media. And again, it was very interesting. You are right, there aren't many women um, for a up and coming broadcaster to look up to who are accessible or are available. And even at Prime Media, you'll find that everyone's fighting their battle so much that it is very difficult to try and I'll hold your hand through this, you know? So they become very harsh and like, why can't you just move? Don't you see we need to move with time? And I must say that at that time I was thinking to myself, did I make the right decision? Should I go back and complete my degree in engineering? Um, but I'm glad I persisted and I moved to the SABC. And the SABC was a different um, you know, uh, ball game altogether. It's a public broadcaster, the story is about people. And again, I reconnected with people and I remembered, you know what, there's something in community radio that is very similar to what's at the SABC. But yes, we still continue to have the challenges that we have. I left the SABC, I went to Kaya FM following on your footsteps, uh, Claire. Um, and uh, Kaya was great again, but I missed the connection with the people and being able to help young people. And, you know, even if it's just a bit or I change one person's life, just be able to show them that um, the space you're in, you can use it to grow yourself and your, uh, your skills. So for me, a, you know, I stumbled into radio and I fell in love. And at this point, I really can't see myself doing anything outside of radio. And I'm happy to say my dreams of wanting to be on air are all gone. I'm really focused on developing talent and growing people and seeing what other people are out there and are able to offer and the kind of stories um, that they are able to tell. And I do hope that um, I, I, you know, I am the one person that one black woman that is available um, that was that would have been available even for myself as a young broadcaster growing up. Mm. So powerful. Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, and if you have just joined our session, welcome to it. Um, you are looking, behold the future of radio. It's on your screens right now. My name is Clem Wisa, and I'm inviting you to participate in today's session by asking a question. Just uh, at the bottom there, there's a Q&A tab. Click on it, uh, type in your question there, and I'll put it to our panelists later on in the show. You know, Shweshe, just coming back to you, uh, I think my initial dream on radio as well. I think we all feel like we stumbled into radio, but my initial dream, and I think everyone's initial dream is to be on air. And then I realized I wasn't as good on air as I thought I was. And then I ended up being, you know, I got into production um, and, you know, I fell in love with programming, but you raised something about talent. A lot of people that join radio days and want to watch radio days, they want to know where are you looking for the talent? Um, how, where, where should somebody start if they're trying to get into radio? Um, because I think for me personally, I think community radio station is powerful. You know, community and, and campus radio get a thumbs up for me, but I'd like to hear from you. Where do you think um, people should start their journey with radio? Um, you know, something, um, you know, um, that Tabeling said earlier on about um, radio recently is attracting people who are personalities or have already built their brand. Um, and I do come across a lot of young people who are very disheartened, you know, complaining that I have a great radio voice. I've invested time in community radio, yet you continue to promote people who have a million followers over myself as a broadcaster. And I think we need to start appreciating that the medium of radio is changing. And people also need to start appreciating that radio at the end of the day is a business. So we need to build audiences and numbers to make radio work, to make it sustainable and have the studios. So yes, we need people who have talent, but don't neglect the fact that you have to focus on building your personal brand also, because that's what you will be selling at stations. So I think for me, um, one of the other things that I've learned and have, you know, that's so important and I've mentored a lot of people who are looking to grow in radio is that talent alone is not enough. 
you can't tell me I've got a great voice and I'm really cool and I've got the language, I connect with young people and that's enough. It's, it will never be enough. What we lack, and I come across this a lot with the young people we work with, is discipline that you need to invest. You need to nurture your talent. And I don't want to use the outliers, Malcolm Gladwell's type of analogy of saying you need to put 10,000 hours to make things work. But you do need to invest in the work that you're doing. And you need to appreciate everyone that works with you. Um, and you, it, it's, it's just so important. Um, talent alone is not enough. If you don't work at honing it and building skills to go with your talent, unfortunately, you will not be able to grow even within a campus community radio station or a community radio station that's based within a township or um, a rural town. Vanessa, I mean, we kind of knew you before you were on radio. You were multi-skilled, you were multi-talented, people recognized your name. You know, when you were making the transition into radio, were there some things that you needed to unlearn that you had learned in other spaces that maybe did not apply to radio? You know, so maybe talk to me about the transition in terms of moving from one, one platform to another. Well, there's lots that you need to unlearn. I think we're it's almost touching on what Shisha said. The radio space has now morphed into a multimedia space. So having the experience that I did have came in sort of handy because I kind of made the transition at the cusp of that becoming what it is now. But what I think is important based on what Shisha said is that people really, um, I think, start to uh, kind of debate what the opening up of the industry is all about. Because you say, you know, personality is becoming uh, radio presenters, which is, is, is what I pretty much did, was I did something else before and then ended up on a radio. And it's such a, a very fine line because the space is there and you learn a lot of stuff doing other stuff in media that gives you kind of the confidence and the ideas and also just the idea of what people feed off of uh, that you give them as a product. So there's those pluses, but at the same time, for somebody who is just a pure talent and doesn't have that other personality side or other spaces in media where they've appeared, what I've always found with a young talent that does come to me and says, you know, I'd love your help. I would have loved to get on radio is that they also sometimes are misguided about why they want to get onto radio which sometimes poses its own problems. Because if you want to get on radio to become the person with all the followers, rather than because you love the craft of radio, then you start having some uh, very interesting interactions in your own space. But to get back to your question properly, Claire, was the thing of unlearning some of the habits that you pick up in other media spaces is that radio is very personal. Unlike TV, where you can get distracted by what's going on in the background or my hand gestures or whatever else I'm doing, what I'm wearing, what my hair's doing, um, whatever, you can get distracted by. Radio is one-on-one. -on -one. People are listening to you a lot in their personal spaces. Yes, radio is played in places where a lot of people listen to it, but a lot of people are listening to you at home. They might have their headphones on. They might be in their car by themselves. So you need to drop kind of the pretense and get to a person's imagination, get to the heart of where they might be at that space and time, uh, entertain them, educate them. So it's a very personal thing, which you don't quite get in other media spaces where the distractions are many. This is your voice talking to an individual and you need to touch them somewhere. I agree completely. Ntabeleng, so, I mean, you spoke about the fact that you were a tax, um, you hosted the afternoon drive, if I'm correct, and then you're now with Metro FM. Just, you know, for people who want to know just work ethic, uh, Shresha did touch on it later on, like the work ethic to even win an award for your afternoon drive show must have taken uh, just a lot. But what is your, do you have a goal? Do you have an ultimate dream? Is there uh, a vision that you have for your journey in radio to ultimately end up in? And what are you trying to do to, to get yourself closer to that goal? Um, because I feel like if people could hear that from you, they would be able to know what they can apply to their own lives uh, for their radio journey. Uh, thank you so much for the question, Claire. Um, there certainly is a, a vision that I have, and I love the fact that you mentioned work ethic. 
I think that is by far one of the most important and most fundamental parts of radio as a whole. Um, when I think back to the time that I was hosting the drive show, um, there were many moments where I didn't have a co-host or I didn't have a newsreader or I didn't have you know, a sports presenter. And I had to think to myself, how is a drive show run? It's not like any other slot. You need a newsreader. You need to have sports. You need to hear traffic. And I found myself in a space where I was doing all of that by myself. And, um, and I think that came from me also understanding that what I'm doing, and a lot of people also need, young people need to understand that radio is, is actually a very selfless profession. It's really not about me, but about my listener. And if my listener is tuned into a drive show, there are certain elements of the drive show that I personally felt I could not, not have on the show. Hence, I found myself in a space where I would literally do my opening link at 10 past, do traffic, at quarter past, do the news headlines, half past, do a full news, and still in the whole essence of everything, run a whole show. But that again then speaks to work ethic. And that would not have happened if I hadn't taken the time uh, to shadow other presenters or to, you know, another thing that's important is that a lot of people, yes, want to be a presenter, but you also need to position yourself for any opportunity that avails itself. So I learned how to do news and how to do traffic because I knew that in order for me to get my foot in the door, it's not only going to be through presenting. If there's an opportunity somewhere that needs a newsreader, that might be my entry point. So I think in terms of work ethic, it's very important, uh, especially as a young broadcaster, to try and learn as much as you can in a, con a space that is conducive to learning. And campus and community radio is the prime opportunity for one to do that. So I think in that sense, um, that work ethic that I had really drove me in essence, to where I am today. Um, and like I also mentioned, the fact that I would reach out to other personalities, go and shadow, go and see how other people broadcast. Not that I was trying to emulate them in any way, but also seeing what works for them. You know, I was surprised to see that some presenters are really good at unprepared radio, while other people are really good at scripted. It's like there's a way that they do radio that works well for them. And by you seeing and exposing your mind to all of that learning, you are then able to carve a way and a path for yourself and what works for you. So I think it's really, really important to capitalize on the opportunities that you have at a campus and a, a community level where you have training sessions because by the time you get to commercial radio, there's no one to necessarily hold your hand. You are hired there, like you should mention, it's a business. You are there to do a certain job and do it well. So I think it's really, really important just as a young broadcaster to first just ask yourself the why, like Vanessa mentioned, why are you actually doing radio? And for me, I always knew it was to connect, is to tell stories. And uh, there's also this misconception about, you know, people making money off radio. It's actually not even radio that makes people money. It's, it's the other things that you do off radio, really, to be very honest. So if already you aligned from the get-go with your why and why you're doing radio is it to touch lives, to impact, to connect, to have conversations, then I would say you're definitely in the right space. And for me, I think from a vision perspective, that's really all I want to do. I want to represent possibilities to young broadcasters that we are in a space where young talent has the opportunity yet again, where it's not just only about the followers. Yes, it's important to invest in yourself because you cannot expect someone to invest in you if you yourself haven't taken the time to invest in yourself. So it could be something small, like one thing that I did was for example, have a photo shoot, you know, so that if I'm if they need images for something, I can submit those. If, you know, there's a, just having a press pack, something as small as that, it goes a long way. So just take the time to invest in yourself so that other people are able to invest in you as well. So I think really for me, um, in terms of that, I just want to grow in the radio space, advance in the radio space. Um, I have a big vision, which I don't want to mention right here, right now. But but it's <laughs> you say you're gonna do this. 
no, no, no. It's really, it's not that. It's I'm I'm personally one of those people. Um, I don't voice certain things until I personally have worked on it fully. So um, I, there's a really, really big vision that I have. But right now, uh, because I am on a training slot at Metro FM, I'm also very honored to be in that position. I'm learning as much as I can. I'm absorbing as much as I can. It's unfortunate with the lockdown that I couldn't, you know, already I would be shadowing presenters, you know, because I have the opportunity to have a wealth of knowledge around me. So I know definitely post lockdown, that's one of the things I'll be doing again, spending time with other personalities in their space, seeing what works for them, learning from them. Because at the end of the day, it's only going to be polishing my craft. After that, I actually want to say kapow. Um, so Shresha, <laughs> let's talk to you about the, I feel like, I don't know if it still persists, whether there's this misperception or misconception about women on radio holding certain slots or holding certain um, positions within the radio space. Have you experienced that? I mean, a lot of people talk about, um, we can count the amount of women who have done a breakfast commercial, who've hosted commercial breakfast, which is kind of sad. Um, but whenever a woman gets a slot, whether it's weekdays uh, and it's in that really juicy time period between you know 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., it's a big deal. Are they still, is, are they, still are people still averse um to getting women is that a myth what have you come across in your in your understanding you know i think um radio is really just a representation of the society which we live in which is largely very patriarchal um because for the longest time the morning voice on the radio when we were growing up was always that man with the bass um you saw a lot of women even being under pressure to develop the kind of base, others go into as far as smoking, so they could have that kind of base in the hopes that it will push them to morning radio. Um, I think we are getting to a point where we are seeing changes in how um, radio programmers are scheduling women and putting them on. I think we still have a long way to go in terms of ensuring that there's gender representation or equity um, in our radio programming. It's certainly not as taboo as it was 10 years ago to hear a, a woman that's on the radio. And um, when I was at the SABC, I worked with Sakina and she was doing a breakfast show and she did it for a long time. Um, again, before it changed and it moved to, um, to a man, you know, we see at 947, a, a strong woman is holding the fort there again. So we are seeing some, um, some changes um, at the city. We've got Twasa being paired with uh, Batokada. So yes, there are changes. Um, and they are quite slow. And I think it's a, it's a problem that we have to deal with just generally in South Africa and maybe um, in other parts of the world where we're saying we need to break the walls of defining the roles and places where women should be, that a woman should do the nine to 12 slot and we will reserve the um, six to nine to a man and the three to six um, to a man. And then the women will do all the women talk shows and have talk shops and they'll have more talk shows. And, uh, you know, so we need to change the way we think about women and the voices of women, because I'm afraid to say that inevitably by perpetuating the stereotype that only a man can tell you credible news, we continue to reduce women to say, if someone tells you a story and it's a woman, the kind your grandmother would tell you. Um, so we, and I think we have to play an active re, uh, role um, in ensuring that we develop young talent, we develop young women, we empower them to get into the roles of being broadcasters that can handle any time slot, that can handle breakfast and can handle drive. And I'm not saying at this present moment, there isn't any woman that's capable of doing it, but the decision makers, the programs managers, the station managers in radio st stations across South Africa need to sit down and say, why is it that we have so many men dominating this, um, the prime time slots on radio. And maybe we also need to start asking questions because the landscape is not the same for every province, for example. 
In some provinces, six to nine isn't a prime uh, slot. Um, nine to twelve is. You know, so there's a lot of considerations that we need to 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 take into um, to to put in place um, in thinking about how we program radio. Um, but I think there's changes. We are seeing changes. Um, as soon as we have more women in the management and decision making um, positions within those media houses. I'm sure we'll start seeing more women and more representation of women in the powerful um, voices within the radio spectrum. What you're saying is so powerful because I mean, it was always told to me that not uh, listeners, you know, for them to hear the content come from a woman um, is a bit not necessarily as harsh as jarring, but something that you know would be a new experience for the listeners. So I agree 100%. There's some amazing female talent out there that are doing that are doing the most. Um, I mean, now I'm just very curious to to get your sense about. Um, Vanessa, what do you think the state of radio is in now? Are you loving what you're hearing? Um, uh, you know, are you not loving what you're hearing? Where are you kind of gauging yourself? How are you trying to keep yourself in check? How do you make sure that you are staying relevant, uh, authentic to yourself? So, um, because a lot of people are just becoming a bit despondent about radio, you know? I think radio is competing with Netflix and chilling and TikTok and Twitter and all of these things. Um, are you still loving radio? Is radio still where it's at? Um, yeah, if you could maybe paint that picture for me. I think for me personally, radio is like everything else right now in society evolving. And when we talk about the new normal, which is where we're at right now, um, there's a lot of space for us to try and decide what it is that we want. So currently, I think what uh, Shesha was talking about, about women being in the leadership positions to be able to employ more women broadcasters is a step in the right direction. And I think also what this new normal has done for us as broadcasters is for us to refine our craft and to decide what is it that we're putting out there that will get people because currently I think most broadcasters are finding that you have to be very careful at the moment because people are a little bit sensitive to put it uh, that way because some people are going through a lot either financially or family or health and at the same time other people want to be entertained like you mentioned the Netflix and the TikToks so radio is going to balance that somehow to on some days you need to figure out sort of have an ear towards what the people are feeling on that day. So on a daily basis, it's up to broadcasters and radio stations to almost, I don't know, sometime, somehow intuitively feel what people and their, their current um, footprint is feeling because we are in KZN and uh, we have to know exactly what's going on with our people in KZN, which is why sometimes being part of a regional station works so well. And once you get a sense of where people are, you can always draw them back from the, the instant entertainment that they're getting uh, kind of sidetracked by away from radio. That if you are hitting the mark on getting where your listeners are at that moment, then you won't lose them to the other, you know, diverse media that is out there. So it, I don't know, it's, a very, it's very delicate at the moment, Claire, and very sensitive. Um, but somehow, somewhere, if you can balance that and get that right, it won't happen every day, trust me, but when you can and when you do, I think that's where it is. If you live in your own cocoon as a broadcaster or as a radio station, you lose that. And that's why it's important to always have your feelers out and interact with your listeners and figure out what's going on around you and not just be an island, because being an island, you'll lose them. It's as simple as that. Thank you so much. Uh, I did invite all of you to just uh, put in your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom and I'll get to them. But right now, I uh, think we have a voice note that we'd like to play. This is Radio Days Africa 2020. Hello, ladies. Um, I think Ntabi Ling coined it very well. Um, breaking into campus radio onto the commercial level can be very, very difficult. But I think the burning question now is, and I think it's a common narrative for many people who come from community and campus radio stations and want to break into commercial radio stations. 
how do people change the mindsets of gatekeepers within the commercial space? Because whether we like it or not, it seems like a lot of people who are in the management, people who are in presenters, people who are behind the scenes even, are kind of recycled. So how do we break, break that monotony? Thank you. This is Radio Days Africa 2020. Okay, I'll start with you, Ntabileng. I mean, explain how you made that move from campus to Metro FM. What was, what, what did you do? You said you reached out. What were the actual steps that you, you took? Um, so I don't think there's one equation that would magically work for everyone. Um, but there was, there was a lot that I did. Um, one being I didn't only submit a demo to Metro FM. I was submitting demos to many stations. Um, on It started off on a monthly basis and then it became bi-weekly. And then I think at some point I was like on a weekly <laughs> rotation. Um, but it, it took a lot of effort from my side as well. Um, number one, focusing on my shows. Number two, picking the right audio. Because I think another thing that we, we tend to forget, I've already had a few people you know, try to send me demos and it'll be like 10 minutes long. And the first two minutes is music. Uh, you know, radio broadcasters, uh, was station managers and program managers are busy people. So already it's number one, getting a clear understanding of what makes a good demo. You know, keep it to three minutes, four minutes maximum. Make sure, the, they always say in radio, the first eight seconds of whatever you say is really important. So already it's just starting with the fundamental basics like that. How to put together a good demo and how do you get the answers to that? Asking the right questions, approaching your program managers and station managers to ask, how can I put together a good demo? Then number two, obviously, is just putting yourself out there. Um, one thing that I learned was to grow a very thick skin. You, not everybody is going to be receptive to you. Not every station is going to be receptive to your style of broadcasting. And you shouldn't take it personally. It doesn't make you less of a, bro a broadcaster. It just means that maybe your personality is just maybe not for that space. So I, one, had to grow a very thick skin uh, because obviously I was rejected <laughs> a lot of times uh, by a lot of stations. So just also getting used to that, knowing that, okay, this is what I want. And it doesn't matter how many times I get a no, I'm going to pursue this thing. Nobody gets it right the first time. I mean, I even remember a time where I went to one station to go shadow someone and I was actually kicked out. You know, it, it can really get to that point where they're just like, no, we keeping our resources to, to ourselves, you know? Um, so it's just that. And even after that, I still sent the program manager a demo. Like I didn't let that impact me. So I think it's really, really important to know that you're coming into a space in the industry that's not necessarily the friendliest, but don't let that stop you. So like I said, I was sending demos everywhere all the time. And also use we live in a world of social media now, right? So use those platforms as well to connect with people. Like on LinkedIn, connect with people in the same industry as you use that platform to connect either with other program managers, um, other radio personalities, just to keep the conversation going as well. So it's not just like this boom, random email from someone that they don't know. I was trying to build a lot of relationships on LinkedIn already. So for me to get some of the email addresses I got is because I created that connection first relationship on LinkedIn. And then I could actually ask them for their email address because it's also important to know who are the decision makers in that space. So I was really just doing that. I was sending out a lot of demos quite frequently. And um, it got to a point where everyone had said no um, except for I hadn't heard from Metro I just kept sending but nothing you know there was no response and then one day that phone call came so you never know when that call is going to come but you just need to always be ready prepare yourself by constantly being in a position of putting out the best content that you can and also the power of social media now is that you don't need to wait to create a demo to send out content. You can put out your content right here, right now after a show. You don't need to, yeah, things can live off 
so many different platforms. So I think it's also really important because there's certain talent that's actually been discovered off platforms like that, where it, they didn't stumble over the person's audio on air, but it was actually on their social media. So just also understand that we need to adapt in the space that we're in right now and leverage of, of all the opportunities that we currently have. Technology is proving to really um, break a lot of barriers when it comes to connecting with people. So really, if you can, use as many platforms as possible to get your content out there. Uh, but most importantly, learn how to do, put together a good demo because that already on its own is one step in the right direction and then form the right connections, grow a thick skin and just know that one day, hopefully that call will come. But until then you can't stop. You really can't stop. She said it all, ladies and gentlemen, she said it all. Um, because I think a lot of people get very despondent. They make the one demo and they just send it out once and then they think, well, that I shot my shot. Um, when actually you need to do it again and again, get better. When I was at uh, Kaya, there would be people who would be in the training slot who actually want to be uh, in daytime programming and they'd come to me and they're like, Claire, I want to, you know, what can I do? And I'm like, send me a demo. They're like, how, Claire? I work with you. I, I sit there just across... It's open plan, Claire. And I'm like, no, no, no. You must still send me a demo. Um, so people within the organization are also sending demos to the program manager that they know um, uh, by their first name. So I think the way you, you described it in Tabi Links, um, you know, getting on air was inevitable for you. We've got a question from Tim Bingosi, Bob. Um, and I think this one would be for Shwe Shwe. It says, what are your views on the fine line between the personality brand and that of the organization, what would you caution against or advocate for? I mean, a lot of people always say that, you know, organizations are always bigger than the brand. Um, people, people are always saying that stations are only um, hiring well-known personalities and celebrities. So Shosha, I mean, what is your, what is your, what are your thoughts around the brand, the personality, the individual, and you know, fitting into the organization and the organization's brand? Um, as a student of brand management, and I'm, you know, this is a, a subject that's really interesting for me. And I've always been um, curious, even from a radio programming point of view, um, do you allow a presenter to build their own brand using your platform? Um, and then as a radio station, you leverage off that to benefit commercially. Um, you know, so I think it, it works in other places. It doesn't always work in all places. From an organizational point of view, I'd say every organization has a responsibility of ensuring that they build a healthy brand, one that is sustainable, beyond a presenter. It shouldn't be that because, for example, um, I'll, you know, Tiwa Touch leaves Metro FM. It takes um, a while for the brand to regain audiences and regain, um, um, you know, the brand love or, you know, all of that for that time slot. So the responsibility of a radio station has to be ensuring that they build their own brand. And also an individual, you as a presenter yourself, you have a responsibility of ensuring that you are building your personal brand and you can leverage of the brand of the organization that you are working um, at to continue building your brand because we know how this industry works. Today, you are a breakfast show host presenter. The very next day, you're doing nine to 12, um, in midnight or even three to 4 a.m. And so it's very important to ensure that um, you we don't over emphasize the other to kill the other. And I'd say for me, any broadcaster that's out there, if you're building your own personality and your own brand and the holding brand, the mother brand, the master brand, which is the radio station you're working at, does not allow for you to be able to grow um, under them, then you know you that is a challenge. And it's something that you have to sit down and think about is how do I continue to grow um, as a brand and create those opportunities to be able to bring in money? Because like Ntabeleng said earlier on, radio is a business of passion. You're not gonna get a lot of money working as a presenter. 
at a radio station, at least until you get to a certain level um, and you can pull the much numbers that are required and you have built and established a brand where you can do live reads and run campaigns at the station, but you still have to really invest in your own brand. And the master brand, which is the radio station, should allow for that kind of room for growth um, and brand development. Thank you so much. Vanessa, a lot of people think that being on radio, being on air just means that you think of a nice topic and then you go in like five minutes before your show and you switch on a mic and then you talk three hours and then you say, okay, thanks guys, see you tomorrow. You know, um, but I'm curious to know um, what have you decided to learn or what have you learned other than actual um, content that you broadcast, you know, the importance of knowing your demographic the importance of knowing the spend on your show, you know, what are the other elements other than just the content that goes out and that you talk about, should a well-rounded presenter know about or be aware of? Um, because it really isn't just about the cool topics and, you know, reading your, your messages. Um, you know, could you fill in the blank? What else should people be aware of once they get the gig? What should you know or get to know? I find out the hard way that it's not simply just turning on your mic and saying, good morning, how are you? Wonderful day we're having. There is a lot that goes into it because you, you arrive in the morning for, in my case anyway, nine to 12. And um, there's people who've made an appointment to be there with you. So first of all, to do them justice, oh, have I lost myself? To do them justice, we can, you, we can still, yeah, we can still hear you. <laughs> okay, it seems I'm back. All right, to do to do them justice, you need to come well researched, which is the first part of it. The second part of it, uh, Claire, is that around you there's a lot going on you have a producer that you need to filter that information through and not just your personality you have your audience thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that also have their own way of viewing things you've got to balance that so that you do not offend people you do not say things that people might take the wrong way of course some some shows are built on controversy but it's not always the way to go for a lot of shows so besides all of that you've got clients who pay our bills that are advertising at the station that you have to keep in mind you have to make sure that you do what they need done right you've got your live reads you've got the commercials that need to play at a time on time rather at a certain time uh you've got your news bulletin readers who have to come in and do what they do at that time you have your programs manager who also has information that he needs you to decimate Whatever topic you are talking about, you have to make sure that that information that you give out is absolutely correct because there's nothing worse than, you know how people listen to radio, like I said, it's very personal. So when it's so personal and you slip up and you say something that perhaps isn't even factually correct, people will come after you and you do not want one sentence to be the reason that people don't take you seriously, especially for us women who we've just spoken about the fact that women in this industry sometimes are taken as the gossipers and not the people that deliver factual information. So when you have a show where you want to deliver factual information, you need to make sure that you have your facts straight. So all of that to say that it really isn't just as simple as saying hello and good morning. There's a lot that you need to be always and for every minute of the three hours in my case that I'm on air, I have to be super aware of all of those elements all of the time. So when people say, being on air must be simple. You work for three hours. It's a grueling three hours, but also you're doing a lot of work before and after to make sure that those three hours go off the way that you want them to go off. And it seems effortless, but a lot of work goes into making it effortless. That's what I said. Like for every link, um, a presenter who's on their game has practiced for years to get that link right, um, to get it short, sharp, to the point, concise, sounding great, doing all the things, touch points. So, you know, the, the whole analogy of the duck seeming very cool on the top, but paddling like crazy underneath, it applies yeah. to every single radio practitioner out there. Um, this is for you, Shwe Shwe. Um, 
How can young women in broadcasting also tap into different departments like technical or programming while still on air? That is a question that comes from Gwena. Sorry, you're still on mute. Oh, you're on mute. Did you unmute yourself? Oh, oh there we go. Oh my yes. God. Sorry. My no worst problem. nightmare coming true. Um, I've had two nightmares in my life in radio. One, when I was doing morning radio for seven years, that I'll be late for my radio segment. And yeah, it happens. And this is quite hard. But I think the, the question that um, Gwen is asking is very important, is that when you get into radio, and I want to say that um, campus radio and community radio stations will give you an opportunity to be able to be on air to be able to produce jingles, to you know, do some bit of music compiling, read news there, do this, that. Um, at a commercial radio station, you're not gonna get that opportunity. Or it's not at all stations you'll get that opportunity. You need to stay in your lane when you get there. You need to do your work because someone else is assigned that role. Um, so I'd say to Buena, if you are at a community radio station now, use every opportunity, use every Every tool that you have access to, use it. If there's an opportunity for you to edit adverts, edit shows, do a talk show, and you wanna try content producing, which is one of the areas I think people have really left out um, in terms of thinking about careers in radio, um, you do, do that, go be a content producer. Um, you know, when I got into a commercial radio station, I thought, oh my God, my dream has finally come true. Until I realized that I'm, you know, you can only do so much here. There are no plenty of opportunities to decide, ah, today I feel like editing that jingle for this and seeing who's gonna say what about it, or I'm gonna read the news today. You can't do that. So I'd say use every other opportunity you get at the level that you are in if you're at community radio station and don't take it for granted. Um, and seek feedback from the colleagues that you work with and find a mentor, someone who's experienced in the field to give you some insights and ideas and one of the greatest tools that we have of our time is this access to online media where you can interact with anyone on social media or you can even go onto YouTube platforms and ask questions. There's just so much information available and there's that much easy access um, in, in contacting people using platforms like LinkedIn, for example, Instagram. Um, so don't take all of these things for granted. Look at everything as a tool that could potentially bring you closer to where you want to get to in radio. Thank you. Um, now, maybe this next question might be a bit controversial, but let's get into it. Um, what do you feel is working and not working in radio right now? Um, I just want to let that sit with you. What do you think is working in terms of radio trends or what you're seeing and what might not be working? Because one of the trends that has come out in Radio Days Africa is a lot of people feel like, well, I'm not a personality. We've addressed that already. Um, but people feel like, well, you know, I'm not a personality, which means they're not going to choose me. I also don't agree with just getting somebody based on their personality because it doesn't translate to numbers on air. It doesn't um, connect to listenership. But I don't know if there's anything that any one of you would like to share on what you feel is completely working and maybe what is not working. Shreshwa, I'll start with you, the brave one with the hand up. Um, thank you. You know, I was thinking about this and the reason I wanna start first is that I really don't wanna rethink and think about my answer. I think radio is at this present moment going through a very difficult time because radio in its nature is a habitual listening tool. You know, you wake up in the morning, you hear this voice and there's, you know, it used to be consistent. So for years, for example, on 702, you'd hear John Roby. For years on SAFM, you'd hear Kolani Kuala, um, who's now late. For years, you'd hear, you know, all of these voices. And then there was, you know, the people that you knew, you knew when you were coming from home you were, you, and you were a person who's in Gauteng, you'd hear um, that they're John Pelman. Now, there's so many changes that are happening in radio that are changing the essence of what the medium is. Because if you remember what Vesnessa said is that this is something that's quite personal. You know, it's me and you 
I'm driving my car and you in my space. And then suddenly I come back and you've decided to leave me, whether by your choice or the decision of the station. And now I'm introduced to this other new person. And just as I get used to this person, no, there's another person that has joined in. So suddenly, um, us as myself as a radio programmer and also as an audience member, you know, I've had to, I'm thinking about, you know, do we need to adjust the way we consume media as the members of the audience or does radio need to appreciate that this is what it is, that it's a habitual, it's personal, therefore you need to respect the members of the audience and that these people are building relationships um, and you know they grow together, they discover things together. I don't know how you know, if you've experienced a moment on radio when someone says something and you, oh my God, you remember them having related another story five years ago and oh, it's so great. Or in instances, and this happens a lot in public um, service stations where one listener who used to call in every Sunday passes away, the whole community is sad. Um, so the, the trends that are happening in radio, I think have mainly been informed by managers seeking ways to be innovative and try to change how radio is. And I don't know if they've considered the basis of what radio is and the, how personal radio is. Um, and there's a number of trends that are happening. And I think we'll eventually get to a pay, place where we appreciate radio and maybe the audiences will also move with the times and, and, and appreciate that managers will continue to make changes that will be upsetting to them. Um, but I think radio will continue to survive and it will continue to be as interesting. Um, but at this present moment, as an, as an audience, a member and a, not a decision maker in a radio station, I'm really just watching and seeing what everyone's doing. And I'm trying to think about whether this aligns with what I think radio is. I agree 100%. I think it's the, the, the April contract negotiation time uh, gets everyone on edge. And I think we all think, okay, what's the lineup going to be now? And this is only after like, it takes me six months to warm up to a personality and to a show and to enjoy the features and to know who they are. And then I'll enjoy the show for six months. And then before I know it, the person is gone or has left that time slot or left the station. So I agree 100%, but I also do believe it means that maybe program managers need to start thinking of long-term contracts. You can't have a long-term strategy for your station and for your programming. Uh, you have five-year projections, but you're only giving your on-air talent one-year contracts. That makes no sense to me. So uh, I think maybe program managers, hey, if you're listening, hey. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you there, Shosha. Um, was there anything else, any uh, Tabelem or Vanessa want to add in what you're loving about radio or what you think is not really quite working for you? Even as just a listener, it doesn't even have to be as, as a radio practitioner. Tabelem, I see you've unmuted yourself. Yes, I have. Um, I think uh, I'll always listen to radio with a different ear because um, of the, the technical training that I've had, you know, from campus radio. So I'll always listen to radio quite critically. And I think for me, one thing, and I'll be very honest, that wasn't working, uh, but I think it's getting a bit better now was the time where we would only bring people in because they're a personality. There's a certain art and a craft to radio, right? And um, you'd find that, okay, it's a personality. They've got a great personality, great following, but there's just this connection that I'm not getting with them on air because there's just a specific art that comes with radio and a way of connecting with the listener. So I think for me, I've seen spaces where it would be a personality, right, with great following, but also balance with someone with radio experience because then at least we're bringing in the numbers. We are balancing the fact that the station needs to make its money. But at the same time, the craft of radio in itself is still maintained. Like how Vanessa spoke about, there's so much that goes into putting a good show together, knowing the epicenter of your listeners. There's just preparing content. There's a lot that goes into it. So for me, I think it's important to find that balance of respecting the art and craft of radio, but at the same time, yes, bringing in the numbers. But I do personally feel that there are, like now we're speaking about black females in the industry. Like if I look at a station, for example, like 947, you've got you know a black female on breakfast, nine to 12, 12 to three. So I think it, for me, 
I'm seeing that that change that's happening in the industry and it's really just giving me that sense of hope and I'm loving it personally, I'm loving it. I love that too, you're so right. I mean, 947 is a good example of the fact that their lineup is, it's dynamic, it's young. Uh, and I think they've been quite intentional about that. And I, I think that's what's working for them. Ladies, did I not tell you this hour was gonna fly by? I told you we've got a minute left. Thank you so much to my amazing panel. Thank you so much to the questions that you've sent in. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. I quickly just wanna thank my panelists again, Vanessa, Vanessa Marawa, listen to her show till noon. It's on Vuma FM, nine to 12, Monday to Friday. Ntabe Leng Matela is hosting the 4 a.m. club, Saturdays and Sundays, four to six, uh, AM on Metro FM, catch it. And if you can't do that, then definitely listen to um, Voice of Vits. The station manager there is Shresha Kuh. You guys have been amazing, like I knew you would be. Um, make sure that you register for other Radio Day sessions happening next week. Next week is the last week, guys, so do the right thing. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Iono FM, the Abundant Media Group, RCS Sound, software and crossfade studios have yourselves an amazing weekend and for myself and the radio days team bye thank you for joining this radio days africa session